of Back at the Faculty Factory podcast. Hi, I'm Kim Skorupski here at Hopkins, and I'm looking at Dr. Farzana Ho. Hi, Farzana. Hello. How are you, Kim? So happy to see you. Dr. Farzana is so kind. She emailed us at facultyfactory.org and said, I love the podcast. Thank you so much for bringing this to the community. Great job. And so she just sent a nice little very generous uh, thank you email. And look what happened. I got her on the podcast and she's so kind and so gracious, decided to be here. Let me tell you who is Dr. Farzana Hope. Farzana Hope, MD, MRCP, FACP, FRCP, is an associate professor of internal medicine in the division of hospital medicine and the co-director of the medicine acting internship at St. Louis University School of Medicine. He also serves as the inaugural medical director of Bordley Tower at SSM, that's St. Louis School of Medicine, Health, St. Louis University Hospital. Dr. Hope holds prestigious professional affiliation as a fellow of the American College of Physicians and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of the UK. So again, thanks a lot, Farsana. That's what you get for emailing us at facultyfactory.org. You are wonderful for being here. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled and it's such a privilege to be here. You're so welcome and thanks again for being here. I was just curious if you could share or interested in sharing your journey back a little ways from being an international medical graduate, you're a woman of color in academia. What draw what drew you to academic medicine? How did you get here? And then we'll talk about promotion, your own YouTube channel, and any lessons learned or little pearls and wisdom you can share with other faculty members around the world listening to the podcast. So take it away, Farzana. I'm originally from Bangladesh. Um, so, you know, I um, I was the first physician in my extended family. It was, I believe that's the best decision I took and truly Credit goes to my parents because they believed that medicine is the best profession in this world to make difference. Uh, although they were lawyers, however, they always inspired me to be a physician um, in my uh, extended family. So after I completed my graduation, I was so thrilled to know that how medicine is been practiced in the U.S. through evidence-based approach. That truly motivated me to come here and to pursue my uh, dream to complete USMLE and then licensing exam. So that was my main motivation to coming from this far from Bangladesh to here. And, you know, after my residency, I chose academic medicine because I, I love it. I love the academic environment. I love teaching. I love being contributed to a scholarly activities because I believe, you know, as a physician, I'm not only making difference by treating my patients, by helping their family members. Also, I'm teaching and guiding the next generation of bright physicians. Truly, I take it as a privilege. And I found that Without academic medicine, I cannot do it. And that also gives me inspiration to be involved in multiple scholarly activities with my students and with my colleagues. Wow. Wow. Your parents are so proud, I know. And wow, two lawyers, I I can't help but think that when you got on a plane and went to the U.S., they were a little bit worried. I mean, how was how are you how did you do you remember put yourself back in your shoes back then how that felt and what you thought about when you got on that airplane so um that was truly uh, a very emotional moment for me and for my family um, because i am the elder daughter in my family and um you know my parents always had very good faith on my um dreams as well as on my capabilities so when um, you know i took the decision they truly supported me um, it was not very easy journey uh, because you know uh, english is my second language i did not have any relatives here in the us 
uh, as well as I did not have enough financial resources to come here and to support myself and pursue my dream of USMLA. Um, because, you know, as you know, and many of our audience know that these exams are very long, eight to nine hours. They are very expensive as well. Um, so, you know, preparing for them is already a full-time job. However, um, you know, without financial support, it's like extremely kind of impossible to do it. Um, so I'm very much grateful to my parents that um, they believed on me and truly, um, I, I think I give credit to myself that I trust my um, credibility as well as I trust my dream to pursue it and take the challenge and with God's grace, I was able to overcome it. Oh, thank you for sharing that story. That's so sweet of you. I I, I agree and I, I know so many people have the same experience it's a huge sacrifice uh going here alone coming here alone someplace strange no family no friends no knowing no one and not coming here to do something fun and travel but rather to, to do something very very challenging so thank you for your sacrifices thank you for being here thank you for following your dreams and be being an inspiration to others and i could you tell us how you said, you know, I knew I wanted to go out in academic medicine because I love teaching and I was all about the scholarship. Where did that passion come from? Like when you were little, being the oldest, because I'm the oldest of four as well, and I think I was a born teacher. When did you first suspect or know that I'm going to be a teacher someday and it's I'll be teaching and I'll be doing research and, and writing and publishing? When do you, do you remember when that struck you as something that was a clear path? You know, I, I believe uh, that motto I live every day because the main reason of my drive um, for, you know, like the knowledge skill is that I want to leave my legacy. And truly, I believe that when I'm treating my patients and families, um, you know, even if I'm not in this world after I'm dead, maybe if I do at least one good work, uh, people will remember me. Even if they do not remember my name, maybe, you know, they will remember my face. And same thing to apply to my um, students as well. When I teach my medical students, uh, my physician assistant students or nurse practitioner students, um, it keeps me motivation to give my best effort to teach them, to guide them, because, you know, I want to leave my legacy as a motivated, as a positive, as well as a skilled physician and educator. And most importantly, as a compassionate human being whom uh, people will remember and respect. I, I believe that's the biggest reason of my motivation to push myself at least a little bit better compared to yesterday. Wow, compassionate human being. What a concept. And then you're making me think, you know, ashamedly that that's not one of our leadership competencies. We talk about training future leaders and helping faculty in, envision and see themselves as leaders and acting from that vision. And gosh, I don't think we ever specifically address being a compassionate human being. So thank you for reminding us that that is fundamentally who we are, human beings. And let's try to insert some compassion. I always I talk about grace and mercy, not only to others, giving them the benefit of the doubt, but to ourselves. I think so oftentimes faculty members, we're just so hard driving and we have we show ourselves no mercy, no grace, no forgiveness. We're so tough on ourselves. So thank you, Farzana, for sharing the compassionate human being philosophy. I love it. So could you could you tell us a little bit about your experience um, as a woman of color in academia? How, how has that worked out for you? Uh, I believe, you know, as a woman of color in academia, it's not always very smooth, you know, and... I believe as a woman of color, we need to be very intentional that, okay, how we can stand out, uh, how we can, um, you know, prove our, our credibility as well as to achieve trust from other people. And, you know, one of my biggest motto of life is that treat others as you want to be treated. And that I uh, remember as a physician, as a teacher, as a co-worker, um, that, you know, I want to be that physician or I want to be that attending, uh, you know, 
that I would want as if, God forbid, if I am the patient or if I am the resident. So I believe, you know, that is one of the golden rule that always helped me um, to stand out from the crowd as well as to uh, establish my credibility and achieve people love and respect. Um, because I believe, you know, in academia or in community setting, whatever it is, uh, people are the greatest asset. If mm -hmm. people do not admire us or if people do not trust us, we cannot go anywhere. So people's skill, I, I believe the greatest skill for anyone, particularly for women in color uh, in academia or regardless in any industry. Mm. Trust. You said the word trust, Barzana. And I, I've been thinking a lot about that word. Trust is the confidence in the honesty of another. And so back to trust. How have you been able to carry yourself with such grace when I know you must have been in situations, maybe not only with patients and families, but with co-students and, and trainees and colleagues where maybe you were not given that same compassion, golden rule attitude back? Can you think of any or reflect on some of these difficult situations or um, emotionally charged situations where you have been confronted with something that, you know, is maybe draws out the the not so nice part of you. And how do you get back to center? And how did, how have you um, regained your composure? Anything jump into your mind? That's a extremely important question. And I'm glad that you brought in here. I'm a, like extremely passionate about emotional intelligence and I, I push myself to practice emotional intelligence literally every day. I have read you know, multiple books, lectures, and I had the privilege to speak about emotional intelligence at multiple national regional as well as international conferences and I gave multiple grand rounds about it as well that how powerful is the emotional intelligence for physicians for physicians leaders and as a practicing hospitalist every day um, you know I start my day with acuity uh, it's like my patients are sick because they are very sick. That's why they are in the hospital. And there is a huge turnover. Every day I'm admitting new patients, discharging, talking with frustrated family members because, you know, they are so much uh, like uncertain what will happen to their loved one when in their, in the hospital. So, Every day at multiple times, I had to um, overcome this emotional challenge. So first of all, I remind myself that, okay, if I am, you know, giving the talk nationally, internationally about emotional intelligence, I better be master of that every day because otherwise it does not make any sense to give this talk. So that is the biggest reminder for me. And second thing, what I do is that if I am, you know, emotionally facing any kind of emotionally challenging situation, the biggest practice I do is taking pause, like, you know, maybe for a few seconds, just to take a few seconds pause Please. and try yeah. to think that, mm -hmm. okay, what maybe other people is thinking or what you would do if you were at that person's shoes. I believe, you know, thinking about that, okay, Reputation can be built you know, for a long time, but it can be destroyed very, very quickly, as Warren Buffett said. So I'm very much cautious about that. And also, I always try to take pause if I am like, you know, facing any difficult situation and try to think logically rather than just only, you know, emotionally. I believe that was the uh, biggest drive. And another practice I do that is, you know, I, one of my mentors actually told me that um, I should, you know, under promise and over deliver mm. because I know if I do other way, uh, people do not have trust. So I always even tell my patient that, OK, I do not want to over promise, but I want to under promise and over deliver. So these are mm. my you know, few mottos that help me to stay calm and composed during those challenging situations.
Ooh, those are so good. Such great reminders. Uh, I'm sitting here smiling at myself because I, I try so hard to do certain things. I have sticky notes everywhere and I'm, I'm always, you know, disappointed in myself. And I think, Kim, when was the last time you even looked at this sticky note? I've gotten so accustomed to this wallpaper border of sticky notes around my monitor. I'm like, oh, you're so ridiculous. You're not doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. So I love those mottos, under promise, over deliver. Our reputation can be destroyed in a moment. Um, pause, reflect, so, so good. But, you know, how when when Dr. Farzana Hope um, has a moment of stress or is uh, is hangry or is um, under pressure, uh, you're taking your pause. I can see you kind of kind of almost envision you reminding, OK, Farzana, you teach this stuff. But when when things have really gotten you upset. Um, where do you go? Like, where? how do you see yourself acting? And then how do you quickly, like, recognize, uh oh, I'm going to that. I'm going to to the part of me where I, I know is um, I must be hungry. I must be sleepy. I must be tired. How? What does that look like for you? A very good um, point, Kim. I believe, you know, self-care is extremely important. And as a physician, as a scientist, um, you know, I always remind myself that doesn't matter how much passionate I am about emotional intelligence, keeping my reputation. If I am hungry, if I am sleepy, if I am tired, if I am stressed, first of all, I'm a human being. So I, we all have a limit. You know, as a natural human being, we cannot cross it. So I'm very mindful to eat my you know, lunch every time however i know that many times i do not get time particularly when i'm working as a hospitalist but at least i try to have some you know have enough hydration have some maybe little snacks focus on to having enough rest so that you know physiologically i am stable enough to do so however sometimes happen that okay doesn't matter you know how much i try um the challenge could be so much overwhelming. So that time I, I, you know, talk to my support, like I talk to my father, I talk to my husband and share them that, okay, this has been going on. And fortunately, I have wonderful uh, mentors as well. Um, I share my challenges and seek their feedback as well, because, you know, I believe that, okay, maybe something which I'm not thinking if I'm sharing with other person, they may have other perspective um, that maybe, you know, I'm not realizing. I'm a believer of that quote that, you know, every um, every story has its own side and we do not know what other side is thinking. So understanding other people's perspective is extremely important rather than just only, you know, narrowing what we are thinking or feeling. Mm. Oh. Again, so you're so wise. I love it. I love the re also the reminder of other people have stories. We all have stories and we have so many dramas and stressors that are not oh. only career and professional, but personal and reminding ourselves that other people are also multidimensional mm -hmm. and layers and have parents and partners and children and colleagues who are undergoing maybe really, really difficult times. And so we're all, um, we're all in a story in multiple stories. So thank you for reminding us of that. And I love how you always said that you share and seek feedback. Um, that is another sign of a good leader in high emotional intelligence, when not only we know ourselves to better manage ourselves. So aware of when I'm in the grip, you know, Kim, you are not drinking enough water. You didn't get enough sleep last night. You got this foster puppy. And so you have to be very careful and maybe share with your tribe, your your peer, your inner your inner circle. Of, Listen, I'm, I've got this new share, um, puppy here. I'm not thinking and firing on all pistons. I'm going to ask you for a little bit of, you know, broader confidence band this week. I'm having a tough time. So that honesty and sharing and and asking for help is really an important thing that I think many of us in academic medicine asking for help, we feel somehow wrongly so that it's a sign of weakness. That if we ask for help, rather, it's a sign of strength because strong people invoke others to not only step up, but to help, you know, lighten the load. So you're, you're exemplifying all of that. So thanks again, Farzana, for sharing so much about yourself. 
you brought a very good point you know academic medicine is truly very competitive and many times we assume that okay who is asking for help is weak or not competent i believe you know that culture need to be changed and we are the leader for front so if we are needing any support any help we should ask for it and i think you know when people are asking our support we should be willing to give because we know that culture eat a strategy as breakfast and we are the leader we should change this um, culture mm, i love it also it's another great quote culture eats strategy for breakfast yes i remember reading that in a couple of books and it's so true that you can't focus all on strategy 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 and process and implementation Rather, it's the culture, the blueprint for living, how we do things around here. That's going to take any strategic initiative and flip it upside down unless we are attentive to culture. So thank you again. Barzana, you recently got promoted to associate professor. So congratulations. And would you share some maybe kind of high level-ish you know, lessons that you learned from that process? Because we know it is a part-time job, essentially, getting ourselves promoted from getting our CV in order, well, back the train up even further than that, getting the national presentations, getting the publications, developing the reputation, doing great work, um, and then putting the portfolio together and getting, you know, the re- referees suggested and help and having the letter written that reflects our, our process. So how, how did that journey work out for you? And what could you share with folks who are listening right now who are maybe assistant professors and they're like, you know, chomping at the bit or not knowing at their fingernails, worried about how they're going to get that done. How did that happen for you? First of all, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. And, you know, I'm so humbled to share that I'm the only woman who got promoted um, this year from assistant to associate. And also, um, I was the, I'm also very humbled to share that I was the only faculty who got, um, you know, promoted after four years of the tenure of assistant professor. Um, So, you know, I'm very much open to share my lessons, which I have learned during the process. And I agree with you, Kim. I I believe this is truly itself a job to prepare your like CV, um, the promotion letter, um, like, you know, finding out who will write the letter for you. This truly takes so much time. And, you know, I will be very transparent. I never realized that it will take this much time Mm. until I sit down to prepare and write down my CV. So, my my friends who are listening, please, if you are planning to apply for promotion, uh, start right now, maybe invest five to 10 minutes every day um, to update your CV or maybe, you know, take a small step um, to increase your portfolio. For example, if you are preparing a talk, maybe add one slide. If you are, um, you know, preparing any lecture, maybe add a little bit on that. This truly takes time. And the second point is that, um, you know, this is uh, we need to be intentional about it because every university has their criteria. So this is not something, you know, we can make it in one day. It takes time. It takes uh, strategies. It takes mindfulness to, um, you know, check box all those criteria. Um, So, my friends, if you are preparing for it, Print out your criteria, know your criteria, and be mindful that, okay, which things you are checking in and which things you need to check in to, you know, move your promotion portfolio ahead. Great advice. I, the five to 10 minutes a day. I mean, that's wonderful advice. That's a wonderful way of building in a habit, almost just like brushing our teeth. It's just a habit of five minutes at the beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day, just go all right, what needs to be updated in the CV? How can I get it in the proper format? What can I do to put move that little line marker further, further, further down the field so that when I'm ready, it's not such a complete overhaul? So that's this perfect advice to little things that will move us along. I love that habit. And Kim, I also love that, you know, how you have that writing accountability group. Oh, I, I think this is fascinating. And you have done a wonderful job. I was reviewing your portfolio, your website. Um, you know, that's fascinating how you were inspired 
studying other colleagues, I, I so much appreciate it. And when I was looking into it, I was thinking, okay, I need to follow this for my next promotion. So thank you and congratulations, Kim. Oh, uh, that WAGs are something near and dear to my heart. My mentee, Dr. Karma Fouché, she's in Chicago, University of Illinois, at Chicago. I've told this story a bunch of times, but when she and I were both at Rush, she came to me and said, I feel like I'm not publishing enough. And so it was her idea to start accountability groups. And then WAGs took off and um, yeah, I've been doing them ever since several hundred people around the country have done them. It's just a great structure of how to get into a sustainable habit of writing. So thank you for plugging that for us, Farzana. Tell us a little bit in the last few minutes about your YouTube channel. Absolutely. You know, the main motivation of my YouTube channel was my struggle. When I came um, to the U.S., you know, as I mentioned earlier, I did not have the um, green card because I was was on visitor visa. Uh, I did not have the financial resources. I did not know anyone because there was no relative here. So it was extremely challenging. You know, every day I still remember that how much um, challenging it was. And truly, I questioned myself that will I be able to do it? Then immediately I told myself, yes, I can do it. So the main challenge was that I did not have any resources or any guidance that, okay, which things to prepare, which questions they will ask, how to get dressed up for the interview, how to address a person. Literally, it was a rocket science for me being coming from another country. It's like very, very different culture. So when I became the um, faculty, I became the um, teaching faculty, I decided myself that, okay, I do not want the another uh, medical students that could be, you know, U.S. medical students or international medical students go through the uncertainty or challenges, which I went through when I was preparing my residency application, when I was preparing for my interview. So that's the motivation I created this YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel is named as in my name, Dr. Farzana Hawk. And in that channel, I post educational videos for medical students, residents, even for my peer hospitalist. I also post videos on how to prepare for the residency interviews, fellowship interviews, as well as job interviews as hospitalist. And I'm very much fortunate that over the last two years, the channel has been growing. And thanks to all the subscribers as well as uh, viewers of my YouTube channel uh, for their support, kind words, and inspiration. Uh, that truly means a lot to me. Oh, Dr. Hulk, I'm looking at the YouTube channel right now. Time management, body language during interviews, tips for pr your presentations. So rich, so much content and so relevant and timely. So congratulations to you for having the inspiration, taking the initiative, despite not knowing anything. It's it's kind of what we do as, as scientists and, and investigators, right? We just go for it. So I think it's fabulous. I'm gonna lead the parting words to you. What would you say to trainees and early career faculty members, and maybe even to leaders who are listening to this podcast episode right now? Thank you. Um, you know, one of the biggest questions um, I truly ask myself that, okay, what people will talk about me, um, you know, during my orbitary? And I believe that is uh, one of the important um, leadership lessons that, okay, what people will talk about me or what I want them to talk about me when I'm not in the room. Um, so portraying uh, myself, for example, for myself, I want them um, to describe me as a compassionate, um, intelligent, as well as a skilled physician, a um, you know motivated, um, as well as a brilliant educator. So I always um, prepare myself as well as push myself um, every day um, to you know make those changes. And another lesson I want to share here that you know sometimes, particularly in the academic medicine, we are so much rush, so much um, thing going on. We are very much hard on ourselves you know mm. so please remind yourself be kind to ourselves first because if we are not kind to ourselves we truly cannot be kind to other persons 
So regardless of your day, remind yourself that, okay, um, you know, forgive yourselves for a small mistakes. Uh, tell yourself that, okay, this is the mistake I'm taking as a learning opportunity so that, you know, it does not happen again. I believe um, that is one of the uh, motto we need to live every day, be kind to ourselves. Oh, Dr. Farzana Khak, you are wonderful. I love the parting thoughts and I'm really taking that to heart for our leaders who listen to this to remind ourselves of how difficult and how challenging it was when we were early career and to be kind and and show some mercy to early career faculty members, mid-career faculty members, or anyone, any of our faculty members that knowing and reminding ourselves as leaders, as deans and all the different versions of deans and directors and department directors and chairs, that um, oftentimes our faculty members are very, very difficult on themselves. And we hear a lot of bad news all day long. Our papers aren't good enough. Our grants aren't strong enough. Our patients maybe are not as happy with the experience in our hospital systems. Our a staff are turning over. We have a lot on our plates. And let's remind ourselves as leaders to take the extra moment to pause, as Farzana reminded us, and remind, remind each other how important we are and the work we're doing and how valued that contribution is. And just just be kind. So let's I, I love that reminder, Farzana. Again, thank you so much for that, for your lovely, I don't know, just being so your lovely presence. I just you have this presence about you that is really um comforting. So thank you so much for being on the Faculty Factory podcast. And folks, look at look at what Dr. Hulk did. She went online, facultyfactory.org, sent us an email and here she was. And we're going to get her back to talk about emotional intelligence and she's an expert in this area. So you can be on the Faculty Factory podcast too. Again, Farzana, you're wonderful. If you want to get a hold of, well, first of all, you know how to get a hold of see her YouTubes. It's, it's Farzana Hook. Um, but here's her spelling of her email address. F-A-R-Z-A-N-A dot H-O-Q-U-E at health dot S-L-U dot E-D-U. Farzana, thank you so much for being on the Faculty Factory podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a wonderful time. I truly appreciate it. Hi, everyone. It's your podcast producer, Casey Callanan. Just wanted to let you know that as of February 1st, 2024, this podcast has had more than 87,000 total downloads and YouTube views from listeners and viewers in 95 different countries. And the Faculty Factory website, facultyfactory.org, has drawn nearly 41,000 web visitors from users in 122 different countries. It's truly an international platform, and we would love to invite you to be a guest on our show. Our host, Dr. Kimberly Skorupski, makes the experience very engaging, relaxing, fun. It is a great experience. As producer, I'll make the edits. So if you need to have any edits on the back end, I'm happy to do that for you. No pressure to nail the interview on the first shot or if there's a mistake or even a friendly dog barking in the background, we'll take care of that. So please reach out to us if you would like to be a guest or nominate someone in our academic medicine community to be a guest. You can visit the contact us page on facultyfactory.org to send us a message, or you can contact Dr. Skorupski, our host, directly by emailing her at kskorupski at jhmi.edu. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory Podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.